there, so we'll see that. Okay, fine. Yeah, okay, so yeah. I've got 41 at the moment. Andrew, Sam. Nigel, Dave. I've got, yeah, the names are going quick. Hang on. Um, Filing in now. Yeah, too quick to too quick to see now. It's all happening. Sam, Andrew, Nigel, Chris. Good evening. I know, evening. Do you yes, know what? it's different, isn't it? Do you know what's what? happening in the house right now? In your house? Yeah. Bella's uh, serving, tea? Bella, dinner? Bella's serving dinner. Because we have dinner now. I told her. There you go. You, I told her, do you remember that, you know, Pop and I have arranged to have enough because Pierre went, oh, is that today? I was like, yeah. <laughs> but right now, so I'm a bit hungry. And my house so smells good. You're missing out on dinner. Yeah, I'm missing out on dinner, but... You're missing out. I might oh, well. once you once you've started, I might disappear and go, go and grab. Hey, some. that's not the attitude, is it? Go grab some scoff. Uh, Paul, no, she's not plugging the heater in again. Um, in fact, I've got it running. Uh, I'm testing it, but I've got it on my 16 amp circuit that's got no LCD on it. Uh, so I've, uh, I've got it running, but uh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're right. Sweet. So, how are we looking? Oh uh, yeah. How are we looking? Yeah, I think we're about there, maybe. I actually can't remember, but we're past the out. We're past. I mean, we're punctual as ever. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's ten past. Yeah, ten ten minutes late starting, and probably about an hour late finishing. That's what normally happens. So uh, oh. yeah, let's we'll see how we go. Okay, right. Um, well, if you're ready, David, I'm ready, and we'll just crack on. Well, hello guys, welcome. Thank you for coming in. That's working. This That's good. This webinar is carrying on one that we did before, which you wrote uh, about testing, basically the tests and the calculations that we can do with testing to support testing and to work with tests. We did a previous webinar, got to our typical timeline, and we didn't even get to live, so we concluded that we'd have to return to carry on just with the live. And we, we set this up. I've been working. You've been working today on this. So this is your presentation. So I'm going to sit here and be entertained and have I'll a view. I see you're, you're washing your hands of everything here. <laughs> just in case. I, I just, I have, I have, I have to just, in, just, 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 yeah. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this has been, um, yeah, I have been out doing inspection and testing at a, uh, a venue, an empty venue. Um, so uh, I've been busy for the last few days um, and we wanted to put something on for you guys because we were aware of the fact that we haven't had a webinar for a few days so we thought we'll, we'll put it on and we'll make it for six o'clock and yeah, we're gonna, uh, here we, we are. are. Gonna, we are going to start running a couple more at this time slot to see if people still would have come to them because obviously some you know we're all starting to go back to work um, but you know we'd like to carry on doing some of these now and then you know it keeps us <laughs> If they're wanted. If they're wanted, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we're just taking up your valuable time in the evenings, the day, you'd rather be watching the telly, just the let day, us know. The day we set up this and we go, where is everyone? That's where we'll get the rest <laughs> It was just you and me talking to each other, which is rather sad. Yeah. Okay, right. We'll crack on then. Uh, then perhaps we'll get done by um, 7.30ish maybe. No, the way we go. Uh, right, okay, this is supposed to be 45 minutes. So this is the live test um, calculations for inspection and testing. It's discussing the live testing and some of the calculations and some of the issues about the live tests that we do. So, um, yeah, we start off with a discussion on earth loop impedance testing. And there's, a, a, you know, there's always a, a discussion as to whether or not we do earth loop impedance testing in various places you go to they say oh no this is dangerous we're not supposed to do live tests we can do this by calculation there is no need to carry out this test we can do it all by calculation um, and so yeah we're told yeah the earth loop impedance uh, values can be gained by inquiry from the distributor that give us our ze and then we can do our calculations of r1 r2 uh, which we discussed on the previous um, uh, calculation uh, and testing webinar to determine the ZS values, just simply adding on the calculated um, R1, R2s to our ZS by inquiry. And certain people would have us believe that uh, that is absolutely fine. Um, that's my uh, comment on it. 
because um, that's what I think about it. To to do an inc have a, an earth loop impedance by inquiry, and I haven't tested it, and then do a calculated R1, R2, and then add that on and say that's your earth loop impedance and that's acceptable for your circuits, I think is total nonsense. Because at no point are we actually testing um, that we've actually got an earth coming in. Now, if we know we've got a good earth coming in, and then we do a calculation and add it on, that's slightly different. But to uh, do one by inquiry, you know, ring up, okay, what's the earth loop impedance here? Oh, it's this such. Okay, thank you very much. And not actually test it, and then add on by calculation and say that is acceptable for a, a finished installation, I think it is wrong. Um, yeah, we, at no point are we testing the integrity of the earth at all. So, yeah, that's my comment on it. Pure bovine excrement. We'd have no idea of the quality of the incoming earth. Uh, we'd have no idea what the actual values were. Um, and it does say in guidance note three on page 66, it says, yes, we can confirm that the, the two accepted methods of verifying ZS as being either measurement using an earth fault looping tester, the looping beans tester, when it's safe to do so, and let's face it, if you've got socket outlets, you know, when isn't it safe just to plug it in? It's just like plugging in a piece of uh, equipment like a kettle or a toaster. Well, or not a heater though, David. No. Um, <laughs> Turn it up. All, so all sorts of things happen then. So it's just like plugging in a piece of equipment. So if you're doing earth looping beans tests on socket outlets, surely it's a safe test to do. Um, or... The other way is to add your measured R1, R2, which we measured during the dead test, to a measured ZE value. That's a measured value, not a value by inquiry. It's not a value by sort of sticking your finger in the air and hoping. It's a measured value. In other words, we're going to do a proper live test on the incoming supply and get a proper ZE value. That is what it says in guidance note three. So we cannot just take an inquired value and add on a calculated value and give some shot in the dark value for ZS. It's guess. got to be, at least one part of that has got to be a properly measured value and that's your incoming earth from your distributor, the ZE. So that's got to be measured. Now, the other option, the other argument there is if, well, if we're measuring that, surely if it's safe enough oh. to measure that, it's safe enough to measure other things. So. But uh, yeah, that's another one for discussion. So that is the method by guidance note three. You measure the incoming earth loop impedance, and then you measure or R1, R2 mm. during your continuity test, and it's acceptable just to add those values together and call that your ZS. Okay, I can live with that just about. I mean, it seems it seems obvious to me. I mean, because we say you know we can inquire, inspect, or measure or calculate supply characteristics such yeah. as external earth fault loop impedance, such as prospective fault current. If we go ahead with this, you know, this allowance to inquire and calculate the crap out of everything, where's the accuracy in anything? Well, there isn't, and, and we're going to miss things because you might have a situation. We we had a discussion the other day with a couple of the guys that were on one of your webinars where they'd actually gone to an installation that had no earth at all. And mm. a couple of people said, yeah, I, I've come across that. There's been no earth at all coming in. Mm. Now, if we go by inquiry and then add on calculated values and don't actually test, then that's the sort of thing that's going to happen. Yeah. And what you might do is you get people that use these plug-in testers like the Martindales and stuff like that, the socket testers, and say, oh, yeah, well, I've tested using that. Well, okay, fine. Well, they'll still give you a, a, a reading and they'll still light up and say everything's okay, even when you're, you've got an earth loop of eight, eight, nine ohms, yeah, which you could be picking up, uh, picking up through your, your bonding. Yeah, these yeah. A lot of those will still give you three lights if you're up to eight, nine ohms, sometimes more. And you could be picking it up through your bonding. You might so, have no it's all coming in. Some of these do do a loop check function, but the problem with that is obviously uh, there's that random number which is their 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 point of of decision making. So it's like one point eight ohms or something, and it really de depends on your protective device, on your circuits. Yeah, yeah. and it's well, one point eight actually equates to roughly what is required for a thirteen amp plug top fuse. Yeah. So that's about the only thing that's good for, you know, um, let's face it, you know, with a 32 amp 
type B break, you were looking at 1.1. If you've got type C, you're looking at 0.55. So, yeah, 1.8 doesn't really carry the mustard, does it? It doesn't do, it doesn't do the job. So. No. No, no. so, anyway, yeah. These are the issues we've got. So, are we going to do inquiry and, and calculation, or are we actually going to do a proper measurement? We need to do a proper measurement. So why does the reg tell us that we can actually do things by inquiry? And this is where the regs is quite confusing. Um, it is included. Yeah? It says that we can calculate the earth fault loop, in, uh, sorry, get the earth fault loop and by inquiry, along with lots of other values, perspective fault current, the nominal rating of the device, and all this sort of stuff, the nominal voltage, the uh, um, frequency, and all this by inquiry. Uh, and it's included in regulation 313.1. Mm. Well, it does say in there that um, distributors are required by regulation 28 of the electrical supply and quality uh, continuity regs to provide all that information free of charge. So you should be able to ring up your distributor and they'll give you all that information. They shouldn't charge for it. They shouldn't give you any argument. They should be able to provide you with all that information free of charge. Now, as we know from experience, when you ring up the distributor and say, what is the value? of earth loop impedance for this new installation we're putting in at this address, they'll give you a bog standard value. They don't know what the actual value is going to be until they actually install it. They'll give you a bog standard value. And they normally tell you 0.35 for a TNCS and a 0.8 for a TNS system. Um, so those are bog standard values and quite often they're way off the mark. What it does also say in there is that failure by the installation an electrician to comply with chapter 13 of the regs gives the distributor the option of not giving you a supply. So when we're doing a new install, yeah, where we've got no supply coming in, we still need to comply with chapter 13. We still need to do inspection and testing as far as we can. And this is where these inquiry and calculation measurements come in. When you've got a brand new installation going in, and you've got no incoming supply, you can't actually do any measurements. You've got to do every, everything by inquiry and by calculation. You still need to do your, st your testing as far as you can, and then using your inquiry values and your calculation values, you can add those together and complete your test certificate as far as possible. So you can do, obviously, your continuity test. You can do your insulation resistance test. You can also calculate your earth loop impedance values. You can also calculate fault current values, yeah? Well, the only thing you can't really do is RCD test because obviously you've got no supply. But all the other things you can put a value into your test cert for. And what normally used to happen, doesn't always happen, but what normally used to happen would be that you would then provide that test cert at the fuse board. And we used to leave it hanging. We used to tie it onto the fuse board. Yeah, and then the supply company would come in, see that you've actually done the installation, see that you've done the inspection and testing, see that you've complied with chapter 13 of the regs, yeah, and they would then give you a supply. If you didn't leave any test information, they would wonder who on earth is doing the job and do they know what they're doing. So this is why we used to complete these things with calculation and inquiry values, leave a, a copy of the cert at the board, Supply company would come in, check it all over, say, yeah, smack on, this is great, and they'll give you a supply. Now you can start doing your test measurements. You actually get a measured value of earth loop impedance, the proper value, get a measured value of, of uh, fault current coming in, a proper value, and check your supply polarity. Yeah? Start doing all those things which are live tests and are required. And this is why we have this business in the regs where it says, this can be done by inquiry or measurement or this, that, and the other. It depends on the situation. It depends on the environment. When you have got no supply, you've got no option but to do it by inquiry and calculation. When you've got your supply, you've now got the added got bonus of having your supply. You can do a proper test. Yeah, but I mean, you hmm? can you can you can use calculation. I did this. I said this earlier on with the guys on training. I said, you know, desk studies. We can do desk studies, we can use inquiry, we can calculate the crap out of it all, but once we've got a verified live supply, we re we've got to recheck those supply characteristics, and then we've got to recheck some of it. Yeah, you know? yeah, and that should be the, that should be the logical sequence yeah. of how we work. Uh, determine the external worth loop and other values. By inquiry provides the values for calculations, allows the correct design of the installation, 
in regard to cable sizes, protection methods, equipment, etc. And this is what the designers should be doing at the early stage, bringing up the supply company and saying, what will the earth loop values be? What will the fault current values be? Get all those bits of uh, information and put that into the design so they can get the cable sizes, the circuit lengths and the protective equipment, get it all done properly so they know that everything works by calculation anyway. Then once it's installed, the inspection and testing carried out on the dead bit, using the calculated values, partially complete the documentation, proving that at least, for instance, ADS works. Yeah. Then, as I say, the distributors normally require sight of that before they give you a supply. Leave your almost complete copy at the board. They'll give you a supply. Once you've got your supply, you can now start doing the job properly and take proper measurements. All the values that you've put on your previous um, non-complete certification are still relevant. If you've done all your dead tests, you can simply take the values off and put them onto a new EIC in which you include all the live tests. I remember when um, we were on the tools, we used to work in a caravan park. The, car the, you know, the mobile homes and caravans would come with a an EIC that was part completed. Yeah. You remember the R1, R2s that yeah. would be done there, the continuity in. It was always questionable because they would, this was the problem. We would fill in the live tests of the one document, but they would fill in the dead. And so really you've got, you've got a, co a crossover of responsibilities. There wasn't yeah. a document that had both responsibilities for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and this is one of the issues, um, and that's why we're, whenever we were doing the actual installation, when we got the uh, mobile homes livened up, we'd go around and do testing at every socket outlet, every light fitting, just to check that the values they'd put in and the values that we'd found uh, were compatible. Uh, if, if they were way off and you thought, hang on, what's going on here? This, this can't make sense. Then you knew there was an issue. Uh, which either with their documentation, maybe there was an error, or maybe with your testing. But one way or the other, there was an issue. But you'd always sort of compare one against the other uh, and make sure that everything worked out properly. Okay, so, right, so we're talking of fault loop impedance, um, and we all know there are different tables. And this is another thing that causes a lot of uh, confusion within the electrical industry, especially in the training side of things when we're talking to students uh, and candidates on courses. Why are there different values in different tables in different books? And, and the on-site guide says one thing and, and the wire rig says another thing. Okay, so why have we got different values? Uh, the impedances shown obviously are the maximum values, which will allow the sufficient fault current. It's all about how much fault current is going to flow when there is a fault. And it could be line to earth, okay, which is what most of these are aimed at, the earth fault loop line to earth faults but we've also got to consider line to neutral faults yeah line to neutral faults although they may not pro uh, get, provide a, an electric shock risk what they will provide is a fire risk and we mustn't forget short circuit yeah obviously yeah we'd look at all these tables and they're all labeled up earth fault loop and we talk about the earth fault loop protection and earth fault loop values but we mustn't forget short circuit values as well and we'll come back to that later Okay, so these tables give us values, and those are the maximum values which will still allow sufficient fault current to flow, yeah, so that we achieve disconnection. Yeah, the time current va values are given in appendix three of the regs. We've got the time current curves in there, and we can all look at those and we can see if we've got so much current flowing in a circuit which has got this type of protective device and this size of protective device, we can work out and see how quickly the circuit will disconnect. Okay. So again, why do we got different values in the regs and we've got adjusted values in the on-site guide? Why not make all the values the same? The tables in the regs, tables 41.2, 41.3, 41.4 are provided for when the cables are at maximum permitted operating temperatures under load conditions. So what they're talking to about is Table 52.1, which says that, for instance, with a PVC, PVC, copper conductor, yeah, we're looking at 70 degrees C as the maximum operating temperature. And then tables 54.2 to 54.5, which look at different uh, types and uh, constructions of cables for CPCs, we're looking there at 
the CPC temperatures. And it talks about the starting temperature and the final limiting temperature of the CPC. Um, why doesn't it say the maximum operating temperature? Well, let's face it, the CPC isn't meant to be carrying current. So the CPC only normally carries current if there's a fault. So under those conditions, we're normally looking at quite high current. So um, it's hopefully only be carried for a very short period of time. So with the CPC, we're looking at what temperature is to start with and what the upper limiting temperature is and how long it's going to take to go from there to there. Once it gets to this level, then we need rapid disconnection. Otherwise, the next weakest link in the circuit is the CPC. And under severe conditions, the CPC could melt. If the CPC melts, we're in a world of pain because we'll then have no uh, fault loop and the circuit will just remain live and the piece of equipment will remain live with 230 volts on it and people will touch it and get thrown across the floor. I wonder why they paid the electrician to do the job. Um, so, yeah, with CPC, it's slightly different. With the line conductor, we're looking at the maximum operating temperature, quite often quoted at 70 degrees C if you've got PVC insulation, uh, 90 degrees C if you've got thermosetting. Obviously, it's related to the properties of the insulation around the cable because copper could take a much higher um, temperature. Table 54.3, and I've actually shown an old version, Table 54C, so um, that's the only picture I could get of one. Um, sure. Provides <laughs> the same, it's the same values. Um, oh, right. um, it provides values for the CPC, and it, as you can see, see, it talks about the assumed initial temperature and the final temperatures. Now, the assumed initial temperature of the CPC in a circuit yeah, is assumed to be for this type of cable where it's combined or incorporated in a cable or a bunch of cables, it's going to be the same temperature as the line and neutral conductors. The line and neutral conductors are carrying current. So they are seemed or deemed to be, if they're carrying the maximum current, they're going to be operating at up to 70 degrees C and that's acceptable. So on these tables for table 54.3, uh, it talks about the initial temperature of the CPC being 70 degrees C and the upper limiting temperature for a PVC PVC cable being 160 degrees C. Once you go beyond that, then we get to a situation where the cable starts to degrade and starts to get damaged. Okay, so things will start to happen. If it stays at that and gets hotter for a period of time, then we could get to the situation where it melts. Uh, we could have a fire and all sorts of nasty things happening. So the tables assume that the CPC is gonna have an initial operating temperature of 70 degrees C and a final limiting temperature of 160 degrees C, at which point, and not beyond, the protective device should take out the circuit and everything should start cooling down again. But there's some variables there because the surrounding cables may not be at the maximum load. If they're not at the maximum load, they may not be at that maximum temperature and they quite often aren't. Uh, consider here, we've got a 20 amp circuit here, which has got a 2.5 conductor on it. It might only be providing a supply to an alarm system or something else quite small. So we may not be operating at the maximum temperature. If we're not operating at the maximum temperature, then the line conductor is not going to be anywhere near 70 degrees C. And if the line conductor isn't at 70 degrees C, then the CPC isn't going to be either. Because yeah, the CPC is only heated up by the line and neutral conductors. As it's not carrying current, the CPC otherwise will be at ambient temperature, whatever that is. Yeah. Okay, it's only when it's lying with the other conductors which are carrying current, it's their heat which warms up the CPC. So if the circuit isn't carrying the maximum current, it's not going to be anywhere near that temperature. The ambient temperature itself may be lower. Uh, I've looked through the regs to find out what the ambient temperature is, and it doesn't actually say the ambient temperature is whatever it is. And for some tables, they talk about 10 degrees. Other tables talk about 20 degrees. Some tables talk about 30 degrees. So, yeah. There is no actual standard stated fact, uh, temperature for ambient temperature. Uh, it, it's all a case of whatever it is on the day. And we have to apply certain tables and certain factors depending on how the temperature, which is actual, 
um, differs from the temperatures that are given on the tables. On the other hand, the circuit may be warmer. We may have a situation, it might be in the middle of summer, might be up in the loft. We all know what it's like up in the loft in the middle of summer. It's like a hot house. So the temperatures may be even warmer than we thought they were. So we're never sure quite what the temperatures are going to be for the cables, depending on all sorts of factors. When we're testing, especially during initial verification, the circuit conductors will be cold. They won't be at those temperatures. Note two of all those tables in our regs book, 41.2, 41.3 and 41.4, there's a little note there, note two, and it states that if the conductors are at different temperature when tested, as they pretty much always will be, they're not going to be, the line conductors are not going to be at 70 degrees C. They're not being used. The circuits are not being used. Quite often, if it's a brand new installation, it's not even been turned on yet. Yeah. So when we're doing the testing, the conductors are going to be cold. They're going to be nowhere near that 70 degrees C temperature. So because of that, we need certain correction factors. And what it says in note two is that if the conductors are not at that temperature, and stated in the tables, which they pretty much will be, the readings should be adjusted accordingly. And it refers to Appendix 3. In Appendix 3, it says, gives you a formula to calculate the maximum acceptable earth loop reading when testing. And the maximum earth loop, ZSM in brackets, should be less than or equal to 0.8 times the nominal voltage multiplied by C min, which is the voltage, um, the minimum voltage factor. This, I think it's 0.95 was the standard sort of factor that was brought in, uh, divided by IA, yeah, which is the uh, operating current. So what we're looking at there is the 0.8, the rule of thumb, as we commonly call it. Now, Guidance Note 3 and the on-site guide provide the tables showing the adjusted values. That's already been done for you. So when you're testing at an ambient temperature of 10 degrees, i.e. the circuits are not in use and the surrounding temperature is 10 degrees, those are the values that you can accept. And these are the ones that are commonly applied in most cases, but not all. Yeah. So the values in the on-site guide and the guidance note three are for an ambient temperature of 10 degrees. And those are the standard values that we can accept, all right? And they've already had this correction factor applied for the fact that the cables are not gonna be at the maximum temperature. When the circuit is under use, it's under load, then the cable temperatures will increase, the cable resistances will increase. So if we took a type B 32, for instance, which says 1.37 in the regs, and we allowed that when we tested, when the actual circuit was under use and the cables warmed up, the resistance would increase, and we'd find that if we did a, a test on it, we'd find that the resistance of the cable, the impedance of the actual circuit, would now be somewhere in the region of 1.45 or 1.5, even depending on the temperature. We'd be well over the threshold of the earth loop impedance value. So that's why we apply the rule of thumb. But it still gives the question, why do I have got different values in the regs and different values in the on-site guide and guidance note three? Guidance note three and the, and the on-site guide have done the calculation for us. It's, it's basically part of your toolkit. Think about the on-site guide as part of your toolkit and you can use that taken on-site and you can directly refer to that to give you the maximum values that you should be looking for in your testing, providing you're testing at 10 degrees. If you're not testing at 10 degrees, you've got to make some adjustment, okay? And there's a table, table A6, which is in guidance note three. I'm just gonna answer the phone a second. Okay, if you're not testing at 10 degrees, then we will apply a factor from table A6. So if we take a 16 amp type B, for instance, straight from the guidance note or from the on-site guide, 
and it's 10 degrees, we're looking at a maximum earth loop impedance of 1.75 ohms. That's what it says in the table for a 16 amp type B straight out of the on-site guide or out of guidance note three. However, if it's 25 degrees where we're testing, then we need to adjust that. So the same breaker will have a value of 1.75 multiplied by the factor for 25 degrees, which we can see from table A6 is 1.06. We apply that, okay? The maximum value can now be 1.86 when we test. However, if we're testing in winter and it's zero degrees, the allowable test value when we test would be 1.75 times 0.96. 0.96 being the correction factor for a temperature of zero degrees. So when we test, we should be looking for a maximum value of 1.68. So which one are you going to put on your book, put in your test form? And this is the thing is, if we go by what's in the on-site guide or the guidance note three, it gives us a benchmark. When we're actually doing the testing, we have to use our own common sense and think, okay, fair enough, that's the benchmark there. But because of the temperature, I'm going to do a quick calculation and I will adjust that in my head. And if it's this or if it's that, I will accept it. Okay. But obviously, we can't put moving targets in, in the test sheets. They've got to be a set value. And that's why the values from Guidance Note 3 or the on site guide are the values that go in there. As we've seen when testing, resistance va uh, factors can vary for a range of reasons. The ambient temperature will change the resistance. The cable loading, which will increase the temperature, will change the resistance. The type of cable, the method of installation, all of that will have an effect on the conductor temperature. Any change in conductor temperature will have an effect on the resistance. So there's always going to be further design calculation adjustments that can be applied. If you look in the design guide, and we're not going to go into those sort of calculations at the moment, that's for another day. But if you look in the design guide, there's all sorts of other factors that we need to consider. If you're looking at it from a purely design calculation point of view, when you're looking to put a, a system together and do the design on the system. And so using the values straight out of the regs book, we can apply those design calculations using the values from the reg book as the foundation. So the regs book is the foundation values for all our calculations. That's one way of looking at it. They are the foundation values for all our calculations, depending on temperature and all sorts of other variables, we can apply those different formulas and factors and we can come up with a design value uh, uh, for use in our design. The on-site guide and guidance note three give us very easy, accessible, quick to use values, which will give us standard values for circuits. Remember though, that you put those values in on your test sheet as your maximum values. When you come to do your testing, if you're testing at a different temperature, you do need to consider that and work that into your calculations. If you're colder than 10 degrees, if you're hotter than 10 degrees, you need to slightly adjust the values. Yeah. And so when you're looking at your test sheet, these are my measured values. This is my type of device. This is the actual maximum that could be allowed. Make sure you do those calculations as well if they're needed. You may find on occasions that you're very close to an earth loop impedance reading, but by allowing for the calculation for temperature, it's acceptable. Okay, it's, it's not straightforward. You always need to consider the temperature. As part of your test kit now is a, is a thermometer. So, okay, so that's talking about the different values on site guide, guidance note three, regs book, and what they're, what they're all about. When we're looking at calculating earth loop in, uh, impedance values, we talked in the first session when we're looking at dead testing about the conductor resistances using the values out of the uh, guidance note three or the on site guide, tables B1, B2, or I1, I2 out of those books. And we talked about that in the last session and how we could calculate cable resistances using those values. Uh, 
and here we go, the tables give resistances at 20 degrees. So if you've got a temperature which is different to 20 degrees, you need to adjust the values using some correction factors. Okay, so this is a strange thing about the regs. We've got some tables that give values at 10 degrees, some values at 20 degrees, some tables give things at 30 degrees. You know, you've always got to keep an eye on the temperature for table uh, when you're looking at tables. So we could see, we went through this with the first calculation uh, webinar, talking about how we can calculate the resistance of, for instance, the R1, R2, uh, taking from the table 19.51 milliohms for every meter, and we can simply multiply that by the length of the circuit, if it's at 20 degrees. If it's at a different temperature, we need to add in a factor. Table uh, B2, gives us the factors to apply them if it's not 20 degrees. Um, say if it's colder, say it's 10 degrees in line with our uh, maximum earth loop impedance values as well. Uh, the same 2.5 line conductor, we apply a 0.96 uh, factor. So we have a resistance value of 18.73 milliohms for every meter. Okay, and we went through these calculations on the dead testing webinar. Uh, if you're not sure about those, that's on, you've got that online, haven't you, David? Um, David? The one prior to this, not yet, no. Oh, it's not, okay, well, it, yeah. it will basic, be going up sometime. Basic, basic calculations went up today. Okay. So maybe right. some okay. of them are in there, I can't remember. Right, okay. Yeah. So to calculate the expected earth loop value of a circuit, which is allegedly the preferred method, the calculation method, so if the installation has got a measured earth loop, external, the ZE measured, yeah, not going to take an inquiry, and I'm not accepting that. It's a measured external earth loop. That's what the regs, or that's what guidance note three asks for. It's got a measured external earth loop of 0.25 ohms. The ambient temperature is 10 degrees. We've got an immersion heater circuit, which is 20 meters long. It's got a 2.5, 1.5 PVC, PVC cable. So you've got a 2.5 line conductor and a 1.5 CPC is a 16 amp type B breaker. So our calculated R1, R2 from the tables in the back of the on-site guide, and back of the guidance note three, we've got 19.51, multiply it by 0.96, because it's 10 degrees, yeah, it's a bit cooler. And then multiply that by the 20 meters, we have a R1, R2 value calculated of 0.37 ohms. Now, if we then did a test on that continuity test, that's the sort of value we should be getting. And we always do calculations prior to doing continuity tests so we know what we're looking for. Now remember, we can allow a little bit for connections and this, that, and the other, so the percentage for connections, but that's the sort of value we should be looking for. If we then add on the external earth loop impedance, which has been measured of 0.25, we can then say with some sort of degree of clarity that the ZS for that circuit would be 0.62 ohms. We can compare that value with the tables in the on-site guide or in guidance note three for a 16 amp type B, they say 2.15. So we're well under that, so everything's all right. So we can use that value of 0.62 ohms and we can actually write that into our test sheet if we want to go with the calculation method. We, you know, we don't want to go to test because we're frightened of it. Um, and we just compare it with the value in the table. And as long as it's underneath, then we can say, yeah, that's fine for that circuit. And that's simple because everything was at the right temperature. What about if the calculation was done at a temperature of 30 degrees? So the resistance for the 2.5 line conductor with 1.5 CPC, same circuit. Yeah. Now we've got a factor of 1.04 for 30 degrees. So we multiply 19.51 times 1.04 and multiply that by the 20 meters. And that will give us a total R1, R2 value of 0.41. Okay, that's increased now because of the increase in temperature. We now, to get the ZS, the calculated ZS value, we add on the ZE, 
ZE is 0.25. So now our calculated ZS is 0.65, slightly different. If we want to opt for the calculation method, we could enter that into our test sheet and check it against the actual tables. Now, when we go to check against the tables, because the table is done at 10 degrees and we're testing at 20 degrees, we have to adjust the table value somehow. Okay. So looking at table A6 for 20 degrees, we've got a factor of 1.04. So we take the 2.15 allowable earth loop impedance value from the table. We multiply it by 1.04. And now the acceptable earth loop value for that circuit is 2.24 at that temperature. So we've got 0.65. The acceptable is 2.24. We can allow that. Okay. Now, we would still enter 2.15 on the test cert if we were putting in the maximum values. Some test certs allow you to put in the maximum values or they actually show the maximum values for you. So you can easily compare your calculated or measured values. Yeah? But if you're entering them in by hand, you could put in 2.15. This Obviously, the temperature is going to change. So we use the on-site guide value or the guidance note 3 value as the actual value to be measured against. Other factors though, uh, or factors will affect the actual ZS value. So when we're looking at the actual earth loop impedance values, we're gonna have a whole range of stuff which will affect those actual values. Consider things like main bonding, uh, connection between extraneous conductive parts which are in contact with the exposed conductive parts will introduce parallel paths. And this will affect, in other words, reduce the earth loop values. So for your final circuits and your distribution circuits, your earth loop values will be reduced because of the connection of main bonding. Main bonding will connect to things like water pipes and gas pipes. Water pipes and gas pipes will have electrical equipment connected to them, like cookers, boilers, pumps, all sorts of things. Okay, and they will introduce these parallel paths. It will reduce the overall earth loop impedances on your circuit. Submarinty bonding, again, if it's installed, will again reduce these values. If you've got metal containment, if you've got conduit or trunking, metal trunking, conduit with multiple earth connections, which they should have, let's face it, if you're using metal trunking and metal conduit, every time you've got an accessory, you'll have a, a connection to the back box or whatever, giving you multiple connections to the same metal work and this will introduce more parallel paths. So your overall earth loop impedance values will be affected. If you've got equipment which is actually in contact with the ground, and we've had this in temporary installations where we've had metal equipment stood on the ground itself, and that provides then a path directly to the ground, and then that provides a path back to the earth electrode on a generator and creates a parallel path for the earth system. Um, and very little of these can be accommodated into calculations. And that's the unfortunate thing is that when we're doing our calculations, we can't really allow for a lot of those things. It's very difficult to actually get things accurate. So our calculated values that we do just using the circuit conductors will often be nowhere near what the actual values are when the installation is in and is, in, as it, and is complete and is in use. And one of the issues we have also is what value do we put in the box if all these things are changing? Uh, the, there's lots of variables, okay? And we will normally opt for the on-site guide or the guidance note three table values if we're putting the maximum values in. Calculated values of earth loop for final circuits and distribution circuits are a bit of an issue. So perhaps measurement is better, okay? so. For, for me personally, I prefer to measure because I just think that once the installation is in and once I've started lining circuits up, I want to measure things and I want to prove. It just gives me that peace of mind that I've actually measured at the socket, at the light fitting, at the outlet. I've actually measured the earth loop impedance. And providing that we take suitable precautions, we use the right type of test equipment, the right type of protective equipment, 
and we do things safely in a safe manner and prepare and plan, then we should be able to do these things safely. So when we're looking at earth loop impedance values, before testing a circuit, always calculate your expected values. Calculate first and then test. Compare your tested values with your calculations. Um, allow for temperature. Test and compare. If you've got parallel paths, the test values will be lower. If there's no parallel paths, your test values should be around about the same as your calculated values. If the values that you get when you're testing are higher than your calculated values, you've got a problem. Yeah, and so that's something you really need to sort of look at. If it's an initial verification, then you need to start breaking the circuit down and finding out where your problem is. If you're doing a condition report, then you need to put the appropriate code in the box and probably going to be, require further investigation. Common question that comes up time and time again, I've got RCD protection on my circuit. Which maximum earth loop impedance value do I use? Can I enter the 1667 ohms, which is from table 41.5 for a 30 milliamp RCD? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, enter the value of the overcurrent protected device. Remember, if it's an RCBO, then you're looking at the overcurrent protective uh, rating. So if it's a 32 amp, 30 milliamp, okay, then we look at the tables. It'll tell you that for a 32 amp RCBO, this is the value of earth loop impedance. Um, that is the way we do it. If you look in guidance note three, where we've got examples of completed test sheets, you'll actually see in there that they've actually got um, examples where you've got a fuse board with split load RCDs, or actually RCBOs, most of them, uh, and they've used the standard values for MCBs. Yeah, so even though it's an RCBO, it's a 32 amp type B, they've used 1.1. Devices provided, got to consider that devices are provided for more than just earth fault protection. So what we shouldn't be relying on is the RCD all the time. Remember, RCDs don't always work. They're not always efficient, depending on what type of RCD you've got and whether it's been tested and it's been maintained, it may not work. So, you know, to rely on the RCD alone to provide you with protection is a bit of a folly. It's like doing a parachute jump, knowing that your main chute is buggered and you're relying on your, on your standby chute, your backup. Um, I think I'd rather not do the parachute jump. I think I'd stay in the plane um, if I knew that I only have one chute. So think about it the same way when you're looking at protection. Don't rely just on the RCD. Yes, if we've got high earth fault loops because of the length of circuit in some locations, then we can allow the fact that we've got the RCD there to um, give us that protection. But you know, when you consider these days where you've got all these different types of equipment, washing machines and so many other types of equipment that have DC feedback, um, the main, main type of RCD that's been put in for years is the AC, which are like a chocolate teapot if you've got DC feedback, they just won't work. So there's a lot of things to consider when we're looking at RCD protection. Don't just rely on RCDs to give you protection. It's a, it's a folly. It really is. You know, it's 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 very short sighted. Okay, so um, what else was I going to say about ours? Um, was I saying about earth fault loop? I think that's about it on oh, no, earth fault loop. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think that's about it for a fault loop. I think we'll move on to perspective fault current. We've got a few slides on perspective fault current. Um, similar approach to perspective fault current. We can do calculations um, and we can work out roughly what we're going to be getting uh, and expecting before we do the test. So calculation of the values initially using the fault current which we can get by inquiry from the network operator. Again, it might be nowhere near what the actual fault current is. We haven't got a supply yet, so it's the only value we've got. We can calculate the R1, Rn values using the tables as before for all our circuits. 
and then together using the line neutral loop value yeah we can calculate the fault current that we might expect from our circuits okay and this is something that a lot of people don't even sort of look into and that's perspective fault current at the end of circuits um, we've been teaching for a number of years now that when we do the inspection and testing we include testing of uh, uh, perspective short circuit current at the end of a circuit and the reason is because quite often we've got long circuits and we've had an over reliance for years on rcds to give us earth fault protection so we have a circuit which is perhaps too long or perhaps the conductors are not quite big enough and we have an increased impedance on the circuit and we have a situation where great under earth fault the rcd operates and everybody goes home and thinks everything's wonderful but under short circuit condition because the length of the circuit the increased impedance in the circuit we don't get enough fault current to actually take out the protected device within the required time the required time is 0.4 seconds for most final circuits uh, five seconds for distribution circuits and so forth but when we're looking at short circuit remember this is line neutral so if you've got an rcd it's going to do nothing your line neutral current is still balanced the rcd will stay in it might carry hundreds of amps of current it might eventually melt and catch fire but it won't trip because the line of neutral currents are balanced so people overlook the situation with short circuit and we we came across this when we were looking at temporary systems we've been doing temporary systems for a number of years um, and we've been delivering courses on temporary systems and one of the things we were doing with temporary systems because of the extremely long lengths of circuits and i'm talking like 300 meters uh, sometimes more we were doing fault current tests at the end of the circuits to make sure that the short circuit protection was still there if it wasn't if we had a situation where the circuit did not disconnect in time we could have a situation where the cable actually caught fire and it has happened on a number of events not ones we've been doing i hasten to add we, we have been uh, we have investigated a few other events where this has happened so we got into testing fault current at the end of circuits most electricians are used to testing fault current at the beginning yeah uh making sure that there isn't so much fault current is going to blow your protective devices to pieces and that's what we're always told check it against the current rating the fault current rating of the protective device and it should be this many ka and you know you can have 10k or 6k or 3k and this is what's drummed into us uh, but nobody gives a thought to what's happening at the end of the circuit it's all about we don't want to blow your protective device to pieces not enough thought about hang on your cable's going to catch fire because there isn't enough fault current to actually disconnect the circuit quickly enough. So let's have a look at a, few, a couple of uh, calculations. So let's say, again, this is a situation where we might not have a supply yet. We've been given a value for fault current by inquiry by the distributor of 0.66 kA. So if the short circuit current is 0.66 we could presumably um, accept that the line neutral loop can be calculated as the voltage divided by that current in other words 230 volts the nominal voltage divided by 660 amps the line neutral impedance of the supply conductor is about 0.35 ohms that's taking a lot of things for granted but that's a calculation that works and that's taken from the value given by inquiry if we then calculate our r1 rn values for circuits and let's just take one circuit in this case it's a circuit and we got a value of 0 0.28 ohms if we add on the 0 0.28 to the 0 0.35 then the overall line neutral loop is now 0 0.63 we can then calculate the fault current from that the fault current will be the nominal voltage divided by the line neutral impedance line neutral impedance is 0.63 nominal voltage was 230 so the fault current in this situation will now be 365 amps so 0.36 ka yeah. so that's our value gained by inquiry and by calculation what we then do is then look say okay what's the protective device for this circuit is 0.36 ka sufficient 
to take that protective device out in the right time. If not, we could have an issue. And this is why it's important to do this at the design stage because nobody wants to go installing cables and circuits and then find that the cables are too small, we've got to take them all out again and replace them. It's time, it's money, it's cost. Yeah, it's, it's a buggeration factor. So it's best to do this at the early stages. And this is why we talk about this business by inquiry, doing it at the design stage. Check the calculated values against the tables in Appendix 3 to see that the protective device will operate under short circuit conditions. If not, then we need to do something about the actual circuit. We can increase the cable sizes, we can reduce the cable lengths, or we can change the type of device. So we might have been thinking about putting a Type C in, let's put a Type B in instead. Is the circuit okay with a Type B? Right, so there's certain things we can do to change the parameters of the circuit. If when we're doing these calculations, we think, hang on, this is gonna be a bit close to the knuckle or it's not just not gonna work. We need to change the circuit parameters. And the normal thing would be to put bigger cables in. Okay, that will reduce the impedance. But remember, we can only control what we're doing our side of the installation. We can't control what's coming in from the supply authority. Metal containment, well, it's not going to affect our values, is it? Because we're talking line and neutral. So if metal containment actually affects our values on line neutral impedances, we've got a bit of an issue. Um, long circuit lengths and multiple connections will affect the values. So it's advisable to check and test your perspective short circuit current at the end of circuits. Short circuit, line and neutral. Make sure your values are within the limits. In some cases, insufficient fault current can create a fire hazard. So let's have a look at an example. We've got a PVC PVC four mil circuit. It's been tested for earth loop and perspective short circuit current at the final outlet. And let's face it, when we're doing uh, testing, if you're testing earth loop, we can quite often, a lot of testers, you press a button and you get the fault current up well that's normally the earth fault current but a lot of testers will have a facility for you to do a line neutral test okay and you can get your perspective short circuit current from that so make sure when you do this you're getting the line neutral fault current not your line earth fault current so make sure you set your tester up correctly you want pscc not perspective earth fault current the measured value of your short circuit current is 140 amps. That's what we've measured with our tester. Testers are great. They give you proper values. They give you the values as they are with the installed system. We've got 140 amps. We've got a protected device, which is a 32 amp type C RCBO. Is protection afforded? Okay. And I specifically went for an RCBO because in a lot of cases, people will say, well, it doesn't matter what we've got at the end because we've got an RCB on it that will save us from everything yeah it doesn't okay so there is much use as a chocolate teapot if they're not properly used and properly selected and properly maintained from the tables in appendix 3 we can see disconnection time at 140 amps for a 32 amp rcbo disconnection time in short circuit is 17 seconds Okay, if you've got Appendix 3 with you, um, you can have a look at that. If not, you might be able to sort of roughly work it out from the actual slide, what's actually on the slide there, depending on what you're watching on. If you're watching it on a mobile phone, then you'll be looking at that thing and we can't even see what's going on. Uh, if you've got it up on a big screen, then uh, you should be able to make a, a decent stab at it. But I'll tell you that it's 17 seconds. It's about 17 seconds. That's the disconnection time. So under short circuit conditions, with 140 amps flowing through those cables, it's going to disconnect in 17 seconds. Hmm. That's a long time for a cable to be carrying 140 amps, especially a cable that small. So we need to know what it's going to do to the cable. And luckily, in Chapter 43, we've got the thermal withstand calculation, which is for live conductors, line and neutral. And that's a calculation we do to check to see whether or not the cables are going to withstand that level of current for that level of time. 
for those of you that are interested, it's on page 92 of the regs. Okay, and the actual calculation, it's, it's a variation of the adiabatic equation. And this one goes T equals K squared S squared divided by I squared. The T is the duration in seconds in which the fault current will raise the cable temperature to a level where damage will occur. Okay, that's the time it's going to take for it to get to its upper limiting temperature. Now, the upper limiting temperature for this particular conductor is copper. Okay, and it's a four mil. The upper limiting temperature, it's PVC, is 160 degrees. Once it gets above that, above that, then damage is going to start to occur. Remember, these are line and neutral. They are insulated with PVC. They're going to rapidly start to um, break down that PVC. And if the circuit isn't interrupted fairly quickly, we could have a fire situation. So that's what T is. So when we look at the other factors um, from table 43.1, which I think is on page 93 of the regs, uh, we get the K factors. The K factors are all to do with the resistivity and thermal conductivity of the cables, depending on how you're installing, um, the type of conductor, whether it's copper, whether it's aluminium, uh, whether it's an armoured. Okay, there's all sorts of different factors there. The insulation, whether it's PVC, whether it's thermoplastic. Okay, so you need to select the correct factor. The common one for most copper conductors, which are PVC insulated, is 115. That's fairly common for a lot of copper PVC insulated cables. That's your K factor. S is the size of the conductor. In this case, we chose a 4 mil. Okay, so if we now start throwing those things into the equation, this becomes T, which is the duration, the maximum duration, yeah, of which the cable rises to that upper limiting te temperature. After that, damage is going to occur. T is, in this case, 115 squared multiplied by 4 squared, and then we divide that by 140 squared, the fault current that's actually flowing. We got that fault current from Appendix 3. So when we do the calculation, I'll do the top line first. We've got two, uh, 211,600. That's 115 squared multiplied by 4 squared, 16. Yeah. Divided by 19,600. That's 140 squared. But when we do that calculation, we come up with a figure of 10.8 seconds. What that means is that T is 10.8 seconds. Let's call it 11 seconds. It's going to take 11 seconds for that cable under that fault current to rise in temperature to the upper limiting temperature of 160 degrees. If it's not disconnected by then, then the cable is going to overheat. Damage is going to occur. In severe cases, this could cause a fire. And this is the thing that we so often forget. Everybody goes on about RCDs and earth fault protection. We must consider at all times the fire risk of short circuit and of non-disconnection. In this case, we've got 11 seconds to disconnect. When we actually did the uh, check on Appendix 3, we could see that we actually disconnected in 17 seconds. Yeah, we're six seconds over the top. So there's six seconds there where the cable is going to increase and continue to rise in temperature and the current is going to continue to flow. And um, damage is going to occur so we are probably going to have a fire right so this is the situation we're looking for and we're trying to get people engaged with this checking um fault currents at the end of circuits it's an important thing to do it's not taught it's not in the books right but just because it's not in the books doesn't mean we shouldn't do it we've got to take a stand on this guys we've got to sort of take you know, be responsible and take up the gauntlet and say, right, this is an important test that needs to be done. And this is an important set of calculations that we need to do. And we need to check our circuits, make sure that we get disconnection. Um, you know, nobody wants to electrocute anybody. None of us want to kill anybody by electrocution. But at the same point, I don't want to kill anybody by setting fire to the house. Yeah. Uh, remember that more people die from fires caused by electrical systems than die by electrocution and that's a sobering thought we need to try to um, 
consider that just because it doesn't say it in the book just is not, not a, a place on your test sheet to put your fault current value doesn't mean we shouldn't do it okay it's up to us to take that stand and decide whether or not this is important to my mind this is very important we should be doing it okay so where are we now um okay to summarize in uh before testing it's important to carry out the relevant calculations first once we've got the calculated values we can test our circuits testing is important i know i know there's this thing about live testing or oh, it's dangerous and we shouldn't be doing it and you know we don't have to do it because we can do calculations the only way to get the actual values for circuits as installed with the installation all complete is to test them yeah and let's face it you know we know what we're doing guys we're competent we're knowledgeable we're experienced we know how to use a tester we know what the dangers are we know what the risks are as long as we've done that risk assessment as long as we're working safely absolutely fine doing testing it's important to give us the correct values sometimes we're going to miss things because we don't get the correct values by calculation okay dead tests must always be carried out before doing the live tests so we always do the dead test first and then energize yeah uh, and do the live tests remember this business of doing bang testing and you talk to students talk to apprentices and you say oh you know you must be doing the bang test they all know what you mean so there's lots and lots of firms out there that do carry out this practice bang it in stick the circuit on does it go bang if not oh it must be okay it's not an acceptable method we should not be livening up circuits before they are tested okay so that's um oh just over an hour that's not so bad um david are you there it's not bad work for you is it no it's not bad actually just over an hour an hour and 10 minutes I've just finished my yeah. dinner. well there you go you. <laughs> good man i'm glad you got your dinner in okay um so uh any q a any chat um my 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 camera's doing some kind of weird green screen thing that's interesting okay that's good then right um <clears throat> nigel says sensible verify testing um and i see in scheme providers really need to get to grip on this with their certs i think the certs um certs do need a severe upgrade i agree yeah um, yeah yeah, yeah. why that. isn't the ambient temperature required on any forms the thing about the ambient temperature is it's going to change from day to day so what we have to do is we need to we we have to use the sort of bog standard figures out the guidance notes and the on-site guide mm. but when we are testing we have to consider the ambient temperature when we're testing but therefore um, so that would, we, can, we can check the values correctly but it would be a good idea to log the ambient temperature that your data was recorded at it'd be a good, a good idea to say yeah this is, we tested we tested it on such and such a day and this is the recordings we got you know if you test i mean if you if you're going to do initial verification or periodic testing on a system that's not in use or is cold or they're getting you in to do the work because they're not busy no one's in all the systems are a lot cooler you know and so again yeah. if you're going to collect impedance values or anything you want to basically just say look yeah uh here's the here's the ambient temperature if we could collect that then because otherwise your data goes off on a tangent if when it's in service or over periods of time yeah the ambient temperature changes so i would if you find you know if we can find the best ways to record track and actually stamp down the ambient temperature of our data when we record it and collect it uh that to me improves things add it into the forms yeah. And this comes back to the fact that, um, and we said this on previous webinars, the fact that the forms that are provided by the IET and by all the other scheme providers, let's call them scheme providers, yeah, um, I won't go into them individually, none of those forms are complete and none of those are actually fit for purpose. Um, and this is why, and it does actually say it in the regs, doesn't it, that when, especially when you're looking at three phase and industrial commercial, that you're better off making up your own forms and it actually says that in the regs it states that and we, we talked about this before yeah so you're yep. better off making your own forms up and putting into your forms what you require uh and we've i keep saying we've got our own forms and i keep 
amending my forms and I did some more work on them the other day and added some other bits and pieces in. And oh, that's the I... thing, if you make your own <clears throat> forms up, you, you can then, if you think to yourself, hang on, this would be a good idea, mm. put that into your form. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as your forms contain the, the minimum requirement, which is what the IET states, but then you can add into your form whatever you want to add into it to make it useful to you. I had, yeah, a, thought, I had, a, I had a thought just earlier on today. I was obviously talking about, uh, where was I today? I've covered chapters 53, 54, and 55 today. And so when I was in chapter 54, I covered the adiabatic equation, and we looked at the calculation. Uh, and we, we used a scenario that went with the, okay, B32, one, you know, 160, B, uh, C32, 320. We went with the current that would be required for this connection to be achievable in 0.1 seconds. But then guys in the, in the room say, okay, but the realistic point is that the impedances will be lower than the maximums. So your currents will be higher. Um, and then, then we kind of chatted about it. And we said, well, yeah, technically, when you do an earthful loop impedance test on a circuit, you need to verify a full loop impedance at the end of the circuit because the point of that test is to ensure the protective measure of ADS is working to chapter 41, section 411. That's it. But also when you've got that instrument, why don't you do a, uh, a, a prospective earth fault current test, maybe at the first socket to see what the earth fault current would be highest on the circuit to see if the protective conductor is up to the job. Mm. You know, uh, we just yeah. discussed that yeah. earlier on. Yeah, but all these all these things are valid. All these discussions are valid. And this is the thing, you know, it's, it's to get people talking about these things, discussing these issues is what that's what these webinars are all about, isn't it? It's the fact of, you know, none of us have got the full answer. None of us know everything. And the more we discuss things and throw ideas around them, the better we get because people will throw other things in and we get discussions going. That's 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 the whole point of all these these webinars and I mean, discussions that's, that's that we have. Back and to that's great. Back to Mark's question, you know, about the ambient temperature, you know, the readings will be affected by, this is the point. I mean, we need to know what this information we're putting down means. We have yeah. this, we have this common attitude or we're, we're kind of shown, you know, here are forms, fill in forms, get forms filled in, your job is done. And we don't. <laughs> and, a lot of us, <laughs> and a lot of us are disconnecting from the actual benefit of being there with the skills, with the tools, with the time, with the opportunity to actually get good grasp and yeah. understanding on that system yeah. and yeah, another, should, another should thing doing a bit better with that yeah another thing to consider would be of course if you if you are doing testing let's face it if you are doing testing on a system and it's brand new it's just going in maybe you're doing a building a factory yeah and it's brand new it's just going in and you do your testing your initial testing on your eic and it's the middle of winter and you're testing it at zero yeah so you're going to do a set of readings and you're going to record those and those are my resistance readings for those circuits yeah then somebody comes back to do an eicr in the middle of summer and it's like 35 degrees and they get a difference in reading mm. and they think well what's going on here you know has there been some change in the circuit and and the only difference is the temperature so yeah i mean it, it is a valid point we should be thinking about recording the actual uh, ambient temperature on the day that we've tested because it's all relevant to the resistance values. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah. Um, Dave's Dave Batteries mentioned the um, manufacturer's data. Um, it's actually quite important to actually consider manufacturer's data when you're looking at. Um, things like fault currents and operating curves of equipment because you know we've got standard values in the books um, and it's the same with uh, cable, Very. current current Very. capacities and volt drops we've got standard values that are in the books but quite often if you go to the manufacturers you'll get the actual you'll get the information straight from the horse's mouth if you go by their spec sheets you will get actual values um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's important to actually get as accurate values as you can. Um, you went by the manufacturer's data, not by the second the cable massive. So obviously, yeah. that this is saying you know because we go down to point one in our regs, and if we go to the manufacturers to look at how much you know the currents that would achieve that time would be a lot of current. So the cable would be massive. Yeah, but, but fortunately, we don't need to achieve that time, do we? No, we don't need to. I guess the question yeah. really, the question really is, if I had, if I had a high fault current, let's say I have a, a low impedance high fault current, but I only have 0 0.1. Yeah. 
as mm. disconnection time, because that's all they're getting the regs, it might be that the cable actually still would be potentially large, but it might be if I actually can accurately record a quicker time, then maybe the cable would go smaller if I can get that manufacturing data. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not sure if physically sometimes these actual pieces of equipment can actually operate that quick. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know who's actually stood, stood next to and timed them. Um, so I don't know if these things can actually operate that quick. Um, this is if you, the... I mean, I've got, I've got 61008 and stuff, and when you look at the standard test conditions, they're hit and miss. They are very much hit and miss with regards yeah, to the way they're tested. Do you, think, do you think they might be hypothetical um, yeah. values? Yeah. Actual values, because remember, these are mechanically operating things. They need some sort of time to actually operate. And their so speed, I'm not sure again, whether you... or not you mentioned ambient temperature. Their capacities adjust with ambient temperature, and their speed can adjust with ambient temperature. Yeah, so. yeah, it affects everything. That's the thing. Ambient temperature will affect everything. Uh, it'll affect how mechanical things work. It'll but this is good though, because these questions that you guys, work. these questions that you guys are asking in chat, this is good because these are questions that aren't in the regs book. But if you go to manufacturers, you'll find some manufacturers will give you, like, just treasures of information. Be to then go beyond these these regulations and that just kind mm. of pushes this subject further along for you because yeah they again the regulations are quite restrictive in this mm. is that, i was looking at a table the other day which was from a, an armored cable manufacturer and it gave me values for the cross-sectional area of the steel wire armoring mm -hmm. depending on the size and number of conductors in the armored mm -hmm. and insulation type and yeah, it also gave me the equivalent yeah. Gave the equivalent of what it would be in copper. We, see, so we, we need that. All that it, sort of information is so vital when you're doing, yeah. you know, testing and stuff. Yeah. But it's not, not. It's not actually in the regs. No. Ah. All right. Um, what else have we way. got? So, uh, I can't uh, move. I, no, I can't move my chat. So. No, I've got thrown off contract doing ICRs for doing this test as I got told it was not needed, it was causing issues and it made the test too long and not enough was getting done. Yeah, well. That is sad. That, that is, is extremely sad um, because obviously the people that have employed you to do the testing don't understand. And that's one of the big issues is that people don't understand. Yeah. Hmm? Send me a, send me a DM over there, company okay. name, and I'll, I'll send them a message saying, why are you shit? And I'll tell them. Mm. Because that is shit. Right. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But it's true. It's true. No, it's a, a shame. lot of people kind of get restricted by that. Um, yeah. Ambient temperature. We get some. All right. So, ambient temperature. We need to get maximum ZS measures. So maybe you better always use fifteen to twenty degrees because of the summertime when power it should be or sixteen to twenty-five degrees even in winter time from the same temperature. I think we need. Um, I think we need something to help us adjust it easily. Uh, mm. I agree yeah. with that. But I think the more the more the people are aware of it, the more people start using it. And it's the same with everything, isn't it? The more we use things, the more we do things, yeah. the easier it becomes. It becomes second nature in the end. I think right. one of the issues is that we, you, you, you spoke to me the other day about volt drop and stuff like that and the calculations in the regs. And there's whole chunks of the regs that we don't normally look at. And it's not until you start digging into these things and start discussing it and throwing ideas around, we all it's, start learning and sort of leveling my, up. Really. My experience is that obviously training gets shrunk down in size and training restricts what you can go into. Uh, yeah. The information is in the book. But we don't go there in the syllabus because, you know, other, mm. you know, the tra training does have that, you know, that syllabus kind of structure. I remember, I remember that, you know, there's, a, there's a certain syllabus that was created by one of the common person schemes about, what, 15 years ago mm -hmm. with that picture of that dude all over it. And that still, get you, that still gets used today. Mm. You know, so they haven't moved the syllabus along. But I mean, the guy, you know, we've, I've, today I'm still doing the regs and we still, I mean, I had a slight technical error today, which lost me 15 minutes, but we still haven't finished. And this is mm. four days we've been doing this. Yeah. And we still haven't finished the Rex course. We're going to actually, we've added a, an extra day tomorrow. We're going to do a morning. We've still got chapter 56, part six, and part seven to do. Yeah. You know, because I don't shut down conversations and we keep things moving. And that's what a lot of training doesn't have at the moment. Um, Mark actually says, Will you be doing the 239152 on a webinar so I can do the 18th edition? We can talk theory, we can talk shop, but the we, big we problem is. We can talk with theory, that, yeah. 
the big problem with that is obviously practical assessment. assessment. Um, yeah. I've, I've just been reading whilst Phil's been doing this in the latest message we've got from City and Guilds, um, you know, about where we're going with this. And there's a there's a paper or there's a um, an open thing that closes tomorrow night, which will then be discussed about moving the technical qualifications forward, etc. But we'll see. But that's our biggest problem. We can deliver the technical information. We can perform and demonstrate the skills, but with courses like that, we've got to find the right way to it's always, practically it's, it's assess. It's always the assessment is an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. All right. Cheers, Robert. See you. Enjoy it. All right. Uh, any thoughts on energy efficiency and upsizing all cables anyway? Well, that was the back in the old eight part eight. It did say that it said the, uh, you know, we had the Bain Marie method and we had also oh, the Barry Center method. We had all these, all these other strategies to try to shorten cables. And when it came, it came to cable current carrying capacity, where we put all that work and effort in to try to use the smallest cable we can afford and that can do the work. It then says, well, go bigger so that you're not hitting 70 degrees because if you're hitting 70 yeah. degrees uh why don't we try and hit 50 degrees because we that we have lower thermal losses um yeah. this there is a calculator that works out your thermal losses we're going to start i think it was it kelvin something meter watt or something and you calculate the thermal losses or the thermal savings and then you look at the time then you look at the cost there is um i can't remember where i found it but yeah They'll push towards it, but this is all the fun that we have with the next uh, update no. to the ranks, or maybe the one but, after that. Yeah, David, I'm going to have to go because I've got some somebody just come to the door. All right, just to see me about something. Oh, hello. I thought people weren't supposed are to be moving that, around, but are you uh, weirdo on the internet talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm going to sort of um, move. On. I, I don't know if there's. Any other questions there that you want to deal with? But right, um, you, you clear, you, I'm going to say goodbye. You clear off, um, and I will. I will, I'll and I'll catch up with you later. Yeah. All right. All right, mate. Okay. Thank you very much, and yeah. uh, I'll see you guys around on the next one, whatever it might be. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cheers. See you, Bob. I'll mute myself. Cheers. All mate. right. Yeah. Just mute. It's fine. All right. All right. Was there anything else you guys wanted to discuss? If he stops sharing his screen, I'm going to get really big. All right. So hopefully he's going to carry on sharing his screen so I can play small. But yeah, um, the energy efficiency thing. There's a lot to learn with that. Um, but the, yeah, the the theory is obviously keeping the temperatures cooler than they are now. Oh, no, that's nice for you to say, mate. Um, a bit sad as well, unfortunately, but um, I can, I have to say, I mean, I've been watching the industry and, yeah, um, I can, I understand it. I understand what you're saying. All right, just see you later. All right, All right guys, uh, let me check out the Q&A. Oh, that fall drop, David. I can't just, I can't say that. I need to do that. Um, we have discussed the idea of doing a fault drop webinar because we've just obviously been talking about this CT rating factor. Um, I tell you, what, Dave, look, well, I'll answer your question in another webinar, right? That's enough for us to do another webinar because uh, that would have been, I'll, I'll drop that question down though, through final fault drop. All right. Current forms, not informative enough. I need a complete overall. Yep. Yep. I agree. Uh, can we just ICN and ICS short circuit on MCB is what they're for? Um, oh, so you mean the ratings with regards to the braking capacities? Yeah. The ICN being the rating component where if it exceeds that rating, it will operate but no longer be serviceable. But the ICS is where it may still be serviceable. Is there anything specific about that you wanted to? Is there anything about that you specific you wanted me to say then? Some of the information you don't even get on MCB. Some of this you'll just get the braking capacity itself. Yeah. So we have braking capacity and we have a just six Ks on those.
Mark. Talking of going up with cable sizing, how soon do you think before ring final goes out the window for radials only? Only when all the old folks are dead that are holding on to that regulation. Basically. Once they go, we'll get rid of it. It's a uh, British, it's a, uh, a British thing. It's a, it's a unique UK regulation. And getting rid of things like that. Look at 303 sixes, you know, getting rid of some of those things. Sometimes, um, yeah, getting rid of some things that are annoying takes a long time, very long time. All right, yeah, uh, Peter, yes, yeah, so hopefully this will be uploaded to YouTube. The one that before this, the one for dead tests, uh, there was a bit of an issue with the recording. I'm going to see if I can edit that slightly because it was just um, the way, what, what, uh, I don't know who it was, but somebody during the recording started playing with this kind of thing and they're going like that and then it got kind of messed about now i've done that i've probably ruined this one but yeah it got kind of um messed about as they moved their, they were clicking gallery or view button so the camera's got a bit moved but yeah uh i will do my best to get it working for you all righty yo okay guys um oh okay Slightly off tangent, is it worth investing in digital reg subscription? It depends, Kev, on how much you use it and where you use it. Um, I have access to that, and I like the book. I, prefer, I really prefer having books in my hand. I've got a pile of books here, so I'm just going to move my dinner plate. You know, I really prefer to get this stuff in the hands, um, but obviously I travel a lot. I travel a lot, and so I want the stuff digitally as well. And with the benefit of the subscription, it does update for you, so you can then get the book when it's more affordable. I prefer to have the book, but the you know the subscription service. Um, if you subscribe to enough of them, it actually is worth it. Yeah, if you subscribe to enough of them. I mean, I've got, I've got a few of them, and I'm always popping back into them, and they're all they're all. I think all of them are searchable. Uh, so they're pretty good. They're pretty good. Yeah. You can't, you can't, you can't put tabs for indexing on digital. No, this is the point. It's a case of just referencing. Yeah, I prefer a book. I prefer a book. So, if I was to say, if you're going to say, should I go digital or get a book? I'd say get a book. If you're going to say, right, should I do a digital re uh, subscription? I'd say, how often are you not in possession of the book and you've wanted access to the book? You know. So it really depends on how much you plan on using the regs and, you know, times where you're not going to have it in front of you. It's, I'll be honest, I mean, I know we moan about the cost of the regs. I moan about the people who put the effort into the regs, but the actual cost of the regs, when you look at other BS standards, bloody get a lot of money's worth. A lot for your money's worth, you do, in comparison. So it's kind of like, you know, I ain't got a problem with paying for it when it comes out. Yeah, right, dude. It's a lot cheaper compared to BSI stuff. Yeah, I like books. So we all, yeah, we all prefer books, really. I think. Yeah, prefer the books. Yeah, stick with the book as long as you can. You might find one day that you could have benefited from a digital. It's when you think. It's when you find that moment where you go, "Crap! If I had that digital on the library app on my phone." then I could have solved that. Then you've got to conclude how valuable that would have been if that then determines the value of subscribing it. I wouldn't subscribe to it for the sake of subscribing it. Um, it just you know, it wouldn't be worth it. Nigel, that's, that's something we have actually tried to look into ourselves, the idea of consolidating some kind of thing. I've said this before, you know, you mean, if electricity, because we've, we've often talked about the idea of what we could do in the future, trying to help improve some things. And if we had electricians like have a membership fee or anything, you know, if this is, this is way back when we, we, where we used to say, if we were going to go down the avenue of doing a CPS, what would we do differently? Um, something to kind of give it back to electricians. And to be fair, I mean, NAPIT do have some, I think you pay for access to it though. I don't, don't quote me on that. But they have some that they give you access to, but not all. ECA has some, but the problem is it's just so many of them. Yeah, there's just so many of them. There's so many standards. 
I needed I needed to refer to a standard a couple of days ago, and it wasn't even in the IET's library. Uh, I was delivering I'm delivering the regs, and it was uh, what was it fences, electric fences, in the scope of VS seven six seven one. It says fences in this VS, and I went to the IET login, and I was like, okay, it's not even in their library. So I was like, oh, well, you know, they haven't even got everything. So yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, look, all right. Um, so thanks for coming out for this six o'clock one. We, we're going to try a couple of this time slots um, over the next couple of weeks and maybe one weekend just to see if, you know, if, if it's helpful for people. Because what we, what we do appreciate is, you know, we're getting to a point now where we're going to try to see what advice we're going to get from the government to slowly try and get back to work. If it turns out that we're still being told to stay at home as much as we can and some things are being loosened, then we will just try to keep providing some stuff in the daytime as well. All right, we'll do our best for you. Uh, but yeah, uh, you, you, numerous ways you can message me. You got emails, Twitter, and thing. If, you, if there's anything else you want to go, if you want anything uh, like on a webinar, just let me know. We're going to do one on Vault Drop. I'm currently somebody. I think it was Emma requested one new PS. I'm waiting for access to a standard which I've got uh, pending approval, so I can do some information on that. And there was one I was going to do on SPDs and RCDs, but I might be doing something with Schneider on that very soon. We'll see. We'll see. I've got to reply to them on that. Oh yeah, electricity work regs. Good idea. And David, hot tubs. I see that. Yeah, I see that. Um, Phil's the man to talk about hot tubs. Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got an inflatable thing with water in it. He's got one of those proper ones. So uh, I'll have a chat with him, and we'll get something sorted out for you, buddy. Okay, dokie. Um... Oh, hang on. One more question here. Then going back to Phil's discussion about high ambient temperatures, trying to get my head around that part. If we believe there's the potential for high temperatures consistently, we therefore record a higher maximum ZS or not as we stick with ZS. Yeah, the problem again with this, Ben, is with ambient temperatures is they, they just vary. And so when it comes to having a value of or a table of numbers, is they have to go with one thing and then they have to obviously give us the method to adjust. And, and so we, we have things like the, the 0 0.004 degree coefficient but the problem really for us is identifying those different ambient temperatures. How do we measure them? You know, are we going to start going around with actual, you know, getting the thermocouples out or are we going to start measuring the ambient temperatures in our wiring systems along different routes? That's the bit that we've not really discussed or looked at in our designs is actually collecting that information and how to use that. I think if we were to do that, or if we were kind of given guidance on the best way to do that, Will it just be a simple, you know, thermal couple in a wiring system or a, I don't know, some kind of digital thermometer or something? If we were then told, okay, you've got 32 degrees, you've got 27 degrees, you've got 42 degrees, if they gave us a number of measurements, we can then work out how to design around that. It wouldn't be too hard. The problem is we just kind of, we don't have that bit that catches the, the temperature first. Otherwise, the resources are here. Okay, uh, hot tubs. <laughs> it crops up everything. I need to go into this. I'm going to go into this group and see these discussions on hot tubs. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to clear off. Um, I've, I've noted a couple of these ones down. And um, I've got, I'm going to do something next week, which I can't announce yet, but I'm going to try to do some, uh, some live things next week if we get the time. And I have got to go and do some work in London, either in next week or the week after. Um, but yeah, um, we'll get some stuff done. All right, uh, cheers everyone. Uh, message me if there's anything you want help with or want me to do some stuff on. Um, and yeah, um, hope we get better work soon. Yeah, see ya. Bye-bye.